And thank you, Francesca. And for me, it's an honor to be here uh, to remember Padre Gallagher, as uh, we were used to call him in Rome. And uh, my talk takes as its starting point a uh, conference, as Francesca just said, held at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome in Mar March 20. 2014, at which Michael Paul Gallagher and I were invited to discuss uh, Flannery O'Connor's posthumously published prayer journal. Father Gallagher considered Flannery O'Connor um, not only an exceptional author, but also a fine theologian. He had even included O'Connor in his uh, publication called, entitled Fate Maps, 10 Religious Explorers from Newman to Joseph Ratzinger. And she was the only writer amongst the great thinkers belonging to the theological tradition of the 20th century. Gallagher substantiated his choice by writing of her fate and how she expressed it through her narrative as a rapture with what we take for granted about ourselves or about religion. Yet, at the Roman counter to discuss O'Connor's recently published prayer journal, his criticism was uncharacteristically severe, describing it as a series of immature pages filled with complaints about herself and no consolation in prayer. There followed a challenging debate between us because Though I, pre I appreciate Michael Paul's position, I argued for the significant merit in the opportunity of how the journal charted O'Connor's growing relationship with the divine and how her creativity and fate were rooted there. This argument showed Gallagher's immense preparation on O'Connor's work and his idea of literature as a road that leads toward Christian faith, as a mode of access to the central questions of existence. But it also highlighted the importance of open-mindedness and how, for a Jesuit, this agreement can be fruitful. Consisting of short paragraphs midway between reflection diaries and correspondence, the Flannery O'Connor Spray Journal is a text which is rather difficult to classify. It is a series of entries contained in a black notebook, which was found among the stacks of unpublished manuscript buried in the attic of Andalusia in Georgia, the farm where the writer lived and wrote. Not written for publication, it was composed from 1946 to 1947, far from home in Iowa City, where Flannery, in her 20s, went to study journalism, yet from where, instead, she returned with the knowledge that her path had changed. She had asked God to become a writer, and her prayer had been heeded. As previously mentioned, Professor Michael Paul considered and respected O'Connor and the extent of his appreciation resulted from the value that the Jesuit assigned to the imagination. As some of you present recognize, imagination was a key word in his writings, intended as the ability that artists has to have to create stories, understood as narrative of experiences, whether realistic or invented, but still able to convey new meanings with respect to the world. Imagination, according to Gallagher, was the key to hope when the poetry of God is calling for new expressions. O'Connor's imagination was not an intellectual game because, as she wrote, the beginning of human knowledge is through the senses and the fiction writer begins where human perception begins. In other words, according to her, the true writer must banish abstraction in favor of concreteness, because fiction is so very much an incarnational art. Gallagher appreciated Flannery O'Connor because her stories had the ability to evoke meaning, to come close to the mystery of our position on Earth 
by placing us on paths otherwise unsearchable. Through her narrative, the reader could have a true experience and enter for the first time into a, into a new world. This is why he considered her as the most theologically alert novelist of the entire century. Yet at the conference at the Gregorian University, speaking before those gathered, Father Michael Paul Gallagher surprised the audience and bewildered me. He announced that his first impression of Flannery's diary was of disappointment, describing it as immature, self-concerned, full of complaints about herself, with no reference to scripture or to Christ. Yet, he admitted that when he reread the journal, he found some jewels, some real pearls, and even some prophetic indication of the greatness that she, she would have later fulfilled. But he found them only in the final pages, in the lines dedicated to the French writer Léon Blois, described by O'Connor as an iceberg, hurled to me to break up my Titanic, and I hope my Titanic will be smashed. According to Gallagher, the young O'Connor at that moment of her life was lost in a sort of negative spirituality, and she was still shielded against the explosion of God in her inner self. So, Leon's, Leon Blois' reading disturbed her in a healthy manner, and did so because of his harsh militancy in defending and promoting the Christian faith and because of his interpretation of the relationship with God as a fight. Following Gallagher's declaration, I was quite taken aback, even thunderstruck. Having read, studied, and translated Flannery O'Connor for more than 20 years and attributing to her writing important moments of convergence in my own spiritual journey, these allegations seemed unfair and partial too pedantic, particularly because we were discussing a word that had not been intended for publication and also written with the vehement sincerity of the 20s. So I start in my defense by saying that the diary provided an image of O'Connor that was uncharacteristically un unedited, unedited because we were privy to an understanding of, of who she was apart from that of who she was through her stories, essays, and letters. Flannery was a determined woman who gave us the impression of being in control of every situation. A sarcastic woman, full of lucidity and wit, who never lamented about her mortal, mortal disease. A witness conveyed through all her writings, which talk about the irrefutable presence and the continuous work of the living God in this world. Yet, in this diary, we came to know O'Connor in all her frail humanity. We saw her insecure, complex, problematic, and less dogmatic. In the few pages of the journal, she appeared immature, as Father Gallagher argued, but she above all revealed earnestly her first spiritual and artistic steps, showing, however, how feeling of discomfort, discouragement, confusion could become resources if they were investigated. The theological assumption of her future narrative arose from such personal and interior magma, which needed to be confronted over time to receive a proper form. Since the first page, Flannery challenged the so-called problem of the ego, a question which, which will be central in all her future works, where all the protagonists are stubbornly closed in their own opinions, until something external, it means the grace of God, arrives to smash all the ill certainties. In this first page of her journal, protesting her discomfort for not to be able to feel the traditional prayers, she urged God in a heartfelt way with a lyrical image describing the Lord 
as the slim crescent of a moon, while her own self was the hurt shadow that kept her, kept her from seeing all the moon. Far from being a self-concerned complaint about her mediocrity and her failures, I read those lines instead as her personal desire of proximity to a divine whose beauty attracted her immediately and intuitively. Yet, in this momentum, she was able to identify an obstacle represented by her own self with its baggage of selfishness, presumption, and, clumps, and a clumsy need for self-affirmation. A self who was fragile, limited, undermined by an ontological condition of sin. This was a clear example of a seed planter, planted in the writer restless interiority, which was starting to sprout up, revealing to us once again how O'Connor's future theological wisdom had its deep roots, not in, an, in, not in an intellectualistic foreground, but in a true experience of life. Father Gallagher listened attentively to my intervention and took copious notes. His response was characteristic of his immense recognition of the importance of dialogue. And although he replied that he usually did not like to relate a writer's biography to their work, he finally commented, smiling to a with the audience, that he had been converted, even if not completely. <laughs> At that moment, Father Michael Paul showed concrete, concretely how the problem of the ego mentioned before was something that he had overtaken in his, in his experience of life. With his reconsideration, he demonst demonstrated how pride and vanity, the main themes of O'Connor's stories, were something which didn't belong to him. He showed an humility which only a great person, or rather a magnanim magnanimous person, does not fear to demonstrate. As a Jesuit, he knew the importance of trying to explore our resistances make sense of them and revisit our position to retrace the whole development of our thoughts and interpretation from beginning to end. In a word, he allowed himself the possibility of further discernment. He demonstrated practically, following our discussion, what one of his main statements really means to renew the freshness we need to dive deeper. Thank you.